power within us, that out through the vessel of our being, you pour forth your wisdom with mighty clarity. Father, we do thank you for we have wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of that spirit that you've so richly given to us in redemption. Father, we believe and receive that the burden of ignorance is dematerialized to your glory. And everybody says, Amen. Okay, uh, now in starting, uh, I'm going to read, uh, we're continuing with our examining gender. Um, and I've been at it all week. Now, let's go to First Timothy. First Timothy, chapter 2. I think you don't get to read Paul or the apostles too far before somebody points you in the direction of First Timothy and chapter 2. It's almost like, I've heard everything you've said. <laughs> what about this? First Timothy and chapter 2. Yes. And what we must learn as students of the word of God is we must not be dismissive over the text of scripture. We must not be dismissive. We must not seek to explain away. We must sweat over it if we need to sweat over it because it's going to shape how we think and how we live and how we express Christ. So extremely important. Now, what, one of the rules of uh, 1 Timothy 2, let's go to 1 Timothy 2. And I'm going to, now I'm going to drop into the middle of a verse to get to the verses that people normally are interested in. I'm going to read 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse starting in verse 11. Yes. Now, so I'm going to read 1 Timothy chapter 2 from verse 11 and we'll take it, we'll, I think we'll do line by line till we get to the end of it. Anyway. So, 1 Timothy 2, 11, it says, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Verse 11 again, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, not to usurp authority over the man but to be in silence. I'm going to read that verse 11 and 12 again. It says, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer, that means I don't permit, I suffer not a woman to teach, not to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. In silence. Now, so, phenomenal piece of scripture and the Lord help you and I as we examine it. Okay? So, now, one of the things that we must remember, just a crash course in uh, the interpretation of scripture. Number one, is that when you are studying anything, avoid jumping into a verse. Right? Uh, because nobody speaks in verses. Nobody communicates in verses. Human communication is not in verses. Human communication is fluid. It is flowing. It is in thoughts, complete thoughts. So human beings, when communicating, will start a thought and go right to the end until they finish the thought. Now, some people are erratic and you cannot band together all their thoughts, but there's no human being that if you take our time, you won't be able to aggregate all what they are saying together. They just might say it over a long period, but they say it. Now, so now, again, the Bible is written in human language. And because it is written in human language, it follows the laws of human communication. Yeah, the Bible is not written in a heavenly language. It is written, for example, this text I'm reading is written in Greek, this, this portion. Then you have some portions in Hebrew. Then some other portions in Aramaic. So between Aramaic and Hebrew and Greek, you, you then traverse or you go through everything from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Then the other thing to take note of is when I am reading, so let's say I come in contact with a verse, I must ask myself, this verse contains thoughts. Those thoughts, where did they start? And then where did they end? Okay? Then I, I must then ask myself, of the things that the author is saying, did he say anything else in the whole book? So I'm in 1 Timothy. So I would say, did he say something in 1 Timothy 3, 1 Timothy 1, 1 Timothy 4, 1 Timothy 5, or 1 Timothy 6? And I asked myself, what about 2 Timothy 1, 2, 3? Now, so I asked myself, did he do that? 
after I've exhausted that, I ask myself again, did that author that wrote the text I'm after write anything similar in any other book? Then I now, so I haven't considered all that. I now know the full range of this author's thoughts about the matter in question. Then I come back to the text in question and I'll say, okay, since I know how this person reasons from this chapter, from other chapters, from other books that this person wrote, now I can come back and I'll read what I'm reading with context and meaning. Yeah. Then I ask myself, right? A very fundamental in human communication. So for example, if I said unto you uh, uh, that uh, Seko is as fast as a cheetah, now, you must understand the way English language is, that's a simile. Now, we are not really talking about a cheetah. Now, if you don't know the cheetah, and I say Seku is as fast as a cheetah, I've told you nothing. Right? So, I must replace the word cheetah with something else that communicates the point I'm trying to make. And I can replace cheetah with anything. So far, the meaning or the intent I had in mind is retained. Right now, so that is the nature of interpretation. A word means nothing until I find the setting in which it is used. A word or words mean nothing outside of a setting in which you find them being used. I can say, Wow, that guy has a bad car. Now, bad car really is a good car in that scenario. Yeah, or you say, oh, look at that sister. Bad girl. Now, bad girl is, ha, yeah, bad girl in that scenario is really good girl. Well, somebody said, let your neighbor be young, your neighbor be near. But actually, <laughs> the way boys speak, bad girl. Like, ah, bad. As in, huh. Anyway. <laughs> yes. So, in other words, if you then say, ah, that guy hates you. You say you're a bad girl. You're know, like, my friend, <laughs> What happened to your head? Did you not see how all I was almost exploding when I was talking about the guest? Yeah. See the girl. <laughs> now, so in other words, words themselves must be uh, examined, yeah, or considered using the words around those words, and then I find the meaning. This is the way any human language is. Yeah, this is the way any human language is. Now, so we're going to apply the same here. The other thing to note is that all of us were born into bias. And we are often uh, agents and communicators of bias. So when somebody says something, I mean, I remember when I was uh, much younger uh, and my mama or papa about to go out and then they would tell you, well, my mom, for example, uh, uh, you go to visit somebody and... The, the host, they ask you, are you hungry? And then uh, you've been a naughty boy. You're like, I know I'm really hungry. <laughs> but you look at your mother's eyes and she's telling you, I dare your grandfather, right? For you to say you are hungry. And then, of course, you will see your mom would then tell the host. So maybe you, the host knows everything. The host has a child too. So the host can see that when, when the eyes of the boy is saying, no, I don't want anything. But it means, yes, bring it. So the host brings it, and then your mom will now say, like, like the culture I come from, eat it. <laughs> you know, if you eat that food, right, the words were, eat it, yes. And in every other context, it means, eat it. But what she really meant was, that's your future you've eaten. That is, you won't follow me to my house when you eat that stuff, yeah. So I'm saying that is the way we all talk. Right, that words themselves do not, do, you can't know what a word means in isolation. So we get into trouble as charismatics, Pentecostals, Christians. We are fond of what is called memory verses. Yeah, a memory verse. Uh, say that one more. In the beginning was the word, and the word of God. Uh, yeah, what's your favorite verse in scripture? I can do all things, so Christ has strengthens me. Yeah, and what can you do? Anything, so Christ has strengthens me. Yeah, can you take over the world? Yes, I can do everything to Christ that strengthens me. Now, but I'm saying that when we do that, we, we do damage to ourselves. Now, being able, to, being able to remember what was said, you might be helped by memory verses. 
But getting the meaning of what was said, you must throw away the verses. That means you must throw away the numbers. Right? I've been speaking to you this morning for the last minutes. And imagine if somebody said verse 1, Seku said verse 2. That would, this, that would actually break the flow of communication. So I'm asking us, because this text here, if you are not a studious person, you will cause trouble. Let me read again. And on account of this, many people have accused Paul through the ages, as they've accused many other uh, writers in scripture. For example, in Deuteronomy, right, uh, 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 Paul wrote, I said Paul, Moses wrote something about uh, how people should separate. And the Pharisees in Matthew 19, they came to Jesus and they said, can a man divorce a woman for any reason? And you know what they were effectively saying? If you read Deuteronomy 24, the way Deuteronomy 24 is written is, if a man shall find any blemish in his woman, any. So the Pharisees used to teach that if a man wakes up and he's just like, why am I even with this woman? He just says, take a bill, bye-bye. So they believed, based upon their reading of Moses, that they can do as they wish, as they want, anyhow, anytime that they want. And they open scripture for Deuteronomy 24. So they came to Jesus and they said, can a man do that for any reason? Then Jesus said, mm, Pharisees. He didn't say whom, I added it. The Pharisees, have you not read? that For you to understand this thing in Deuteronomy, have you not read that he that made them at the beginning? That's Genesis. Meaning he's saying, you have a Deuteronomy question, but the guy that wrote Deuteronomy also had, uh, wrote Genesis. So if I want to understand Deuteronomy 24, don't jump into verse 20, chapter 24. Start at the beginning. It says, have you not read that he that made them at the beginning made them male and female? Genesis 1, right at the beginning. So in other words, what you learn from Jesus is that when I'm reading the scriptures, hence I must, if I'm reading Moses in Deuteronomy, I must be conscious of Moses in Genesis. And by extension, Moses in Leviticus, in Numbers, I must be conscious of all that Moses wrote. Then I take all he wrote into what I'm reading and I cannot say this is what he must have meant. Yes? Yeah? Good. So, if we don't do that, we do a disservice and we can use the word of God to do and say anything. So, let's go one more time. First Timothy, chapter 2 and verse 11. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to what? To teach. Nor to what? Or sub authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now, let me help you out. You see, when he said not to usurp authority, the word used for authority there only occurs once in the whole of the Bible. Yeah? So, before you think you know what authority there means. <laughs> yeah? So, again, let's help ourselves. The Bible is not a Western book. We read it Western. Because all of us speak English today, we feel that of course, the Bible and uh, all civilized texts is in English. But English is a recent little, is a recent baby, right? In the society of language. It's a recent addition, right? The real civilizations of humanity were firstly Middle Eastern, right? Around that crescent of the Middle East. Now, the way they think and the way they reason and the way they write is quite different from the way we do it in the West. Even in the West, the way that we speak our language, this English that we speak, it has changed in the last 800 years in spelling, in a way of expression. So I must be careful when I'm reading the text, therefore, before I jump. I said the word used for authority here. Go check it. The word used for authority here, of course, only Paul used it only once in all his writings. No apostle used it. Jesus didn't use it. Right? Now, so... You go back, even if you read the Septuagint, which is the Genesis to Malachi written in Greek, right? You will find that it's a rare word he has used. So if somebody has used a rare word, I must approach what he has written cautiously. He's not wrong. He's just telling me there's something I need to say here that demands your attention. So I'm going to use a word that will have to force you to stop and think. 
I wasn't saying, oh, authority. Oh, who doesn't know authority? The woman is not allowed to be in charge. Eh, 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 eh. You just jumped. He gave you and I a very high wall to scale. Don't scale it too easily. So he says here in 1 Timothy 2 11, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. I, I, but I suffer not a woman to teach, not to usurp authority over the man. By the way, guys, this is the text of scripture that certain denominations they use to forbid or restrict women from being priests or for, from exercising any didactic function in the church, from any teaching function in the church. So they will say that women can do everything except teach. And say, pray tell, why? Paul said so. Really? But what we are reading appears to say that. And if that's what it says, my dear friend, that's what it says. Only is that what it says? That's the question. Is that what? Is that what it says? So you, you and I must, because another way of looking at it is Paul has written a gender-defining text of scripture. Of course, let me be troublesome with you a little, if you'll uh, allow me. Let me be trouble, troublesome with you a little. So we meet a guy. This is 2024. Assuming we could teleport and we'll go back into the past. So we're going to go back 30 years into the past. Let's make it easy. We're going to go back to exactly 24 years into the past. So what year are we in? 2000. So in year 2000, we behold this guy walking on the street. Uh, and this guy is a girl. He's a girl. He's an XX. You get XS? XX chromosome. Girl. Yes. And then, you know, something happens to her. And she's having some gender dysmorphia or whatever the case is that people go through. And so she wants to do a gender reassignment. And so she goes through a gender reassignment and science successfully makes her a man. And then she marries. So they, they now marry. She, she, XX that became a man now marries a woman. Yes. Yes, good. And then all of this happened by 2003. Let me use numbers that are easy. 2004. By 2004, not only has been reassigned a guy, now married. Then you come around in 2024 and you preach to that person. Yes. Can we preach to such? Yes. Finding your heart to preach. So we preach to such and they get born again. Can they get born again? Yes. So they get born again. Yes. So they get born again. And we now want to apply 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 11. Is that person a man or a woman? Because the moment you're in trouble, then you are saying that the Bible is written with gender, biological gender in mind. We caught you. We caught you. We caught you red-handed. Because then you are saying... That just XX or XY has spiritual connotations to it. The way that my father's sperma met with my mother's uh, egg suddenly determines what my, my lot is in life spiritually. If I was a twin and I was born with, uh, uh, and my twin was a girl, then what you're going to tell me I'm a twin will be different just because of the combination of the eggs and the whatever. Yeah. I'm not sure about Good. Yeah. Don't recall the combination. Is that not funny? A combination that happened outside Christ. When the person did not know light or darkness. Now the person is light in the Lord, but is still bound by what happened when Mama and Papa were in the throes of passion. Are we not troublesome? And does that not make the Bible vexatious? Supposing that's what you think he's saying. Because what do we tell that guy? Now, Paul makes it, trouble, makes it more troublesome in 1 Corinthians 7. He said, let everybody abide in the same calling wherein they are called. That means if you are already gender reassigned and you met Christ, don't change it. Eh? <laughs> yes, we have to take a series after that, about that. Amen. I I'm not even sure that I'm making the matter easier for you or harder. But I'm saying, I'm talking about we are living in the 21st century world, does your understanding of Bible stand the true test of time, of reality when you meet people 
in their everyday living? Or is your brain a spin? Just say, oh, look, even God has a dick on your matter. <laughs> God has a dick on your matter. Yeah? Amen. Are you like some people just say that that marriage is null and void now? You met Jesus. Anyway, that's not even my, my point. I'm just saying, just a simple conversation. You know, uh, when I was born, people needed to talk about gender reassignment. Maybe to be the stuff of uh, science fiction. But over the space of the last few decades, humanity can do some things. And it will be demonic. It will be the proper understanding of human anatomy. So I'm saying, and you must ask yourself these blunt questions. Is the Bible written to favor the XY chromosome? Otherwise, what is a man? What is this man that the Bible talks about? What is that woman? Or do you know, ask yourself, how do you define? So we're back to identity. How do you define or describe a man or a woman? You see, we can, we can laugh all we like about uh, they, them, he, she, and then the alphabets are getting to be, I mean, uh, in the office, uh, you get to do some uh, inclusion or diversity uh, trainings, and your brain is popping. Your brain is popping, because you are sure you know what things mean until you find this fluidity everywhere. Yeah? Yet, we must be able, but I'm saying it's not even because of that, I'm saying we, we live in a world where we must be able to answer the question, is the Bible gender biased? Is it really gender biased? Now, get it right, though. I'm a believer. If the Bible is gender biased, it is gender biased. That is, hold on, let me say it again. If the Bible, rightly divided, properly explained, is gender biased, it happens to be that I believe the document that is gender biased. And I serve a God that is gender biased. Tough luck. I don't like it, but I believe her. I believe. So get it right. <laughs> I have no axe to grind. But every single thing in your liver and tendon tells you that when it's stated that way, it cannot be true. Even then, we must not enter the text with our bias. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. But a church person, ecclesiastical, comes and says, Seku, forget that teaching you're about to say. Let the woman learn in silence without subjection. I suffer not a woman. They were like, why is why is the, why are the blood vessels on your neck about a bust on the word woman? Now, we could take you to town on now. I'm going to, I, I, I took my time in introducing this morning because I want us to see that is a lot hanging on the back of understanding what the text of scripture says. Amen? Okay, now, so let's apply the rules in, in order. Let's say that First Timothy chapter 2, verse 11, verse 12, verse 13, and verse 14 are contentious. Let's say they're contentious. Let's say we don't know and we can't agree on what it means for status. So the first thing you do is, this person, Paul, has written a letter can come back to Romans or Galatians, sorry. I'm about to say something and then I need you to see why. Galatians 5 and verse, uh, verse what? Yes, Galatians 5 verse what? 14, <laughs> only that noise. <laughs> Galatians 5, 14. are you there? Let's go. For all the law, somebody say all the law. All the law is fulfilled in one word. In what? What is the word? Thou shall love a neighbor as thyself. So I can take all the law, which would be Matthew, sorry, Genesis to Malachi. And Paul made an audacious statement in one word. So that means I can stand back looking at the hundreds of pages of Genesis to Malachi. And I can say that I tell you with all gravity that what all of this is saying I can say it in one word. Love your neighbor. Look at Romans and chapter 13. Romans 13. Romans 13. Are you there? I'm in Romans 13. I'm in verse 8. Oh, no man anything but to love what? Romans 13, 8. Oh, no man anything but to love one another for he that 
Love and honor that has fulfilled the law. Verse 9. For these, number one, thou shalt not commit adultery. Number two, thou shalt not kill. Number three, thou shalt not steal. Number four, thou shalt not be a false witness. Number five, thou shalt not covet if there be any other commandment. So if I can read all the thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt. If there be any other commandment, what did he say after that? It is briefly comprehended in this saying. So we see that Paul wrote to the Romans as he wrote to the Galatians. That all of what the law says can be stated in a briefer way. That is a more brief way of stating something that is stated long. So you know what the Bible is written in long and and in summary. It's written and if I don't understand the summary, I don't understand the long hand. Okay, now, so it says, it's briefly comprehended in this, namely, thou shall love what? Your neighbor as thyself. Look at Matthew. Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22. Uh, somebody asked Jesus a question in verse 35. Uh, then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked Jesus a question, tempting him and saying. That means that the question was a temptation. Verse 36, master, that means teacher, right? Which is the great commandment in what? In the law. That means when you go through uh, the writings from Genesis to Malachi, what, what is he all about? That's meaning of God's great commandment. Look at verse 37. Jesus said unto him, thou shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first. That means there's nothing before this. This is the first. This is what every other thing comes after. That's the meaning of the word first. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto the first. What's the second? Thou shall love thy neighbor as thyself. Verse 40. On these two hang everything. That's what he said. Look at verse, uh, um, on these two and what? Everything. On these two. So, G please, let me ask, let me ask, let me have us listen to the question again. Master, we can see Genesis to Malachi, right? What is the great? What is the gist? What is the heart? What is the call, right? What is the pivotal thing that they are trying to say? And somebody, and then we'll have thought that Jesus will say, ah, ah, ah. There are 39 books. How do you expect me to tell you in, in, in short? No, no, don't tell me that in short. Right? That 30, and many of them have many chapters. Genesis, that's 50. And, and you go on, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, Chronicles, 2 Chronicles. You have Psalms, 150 chapters. Yeah. I mean, it just goes on and left. And here, somebody then came to Jesus. <laughs> What's the call? What's the great? And Jesus, without batting an eyelid, said, Oh, the first is this, 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 this. That means Jesus knew that the scriptures in long and say one thing, in short and it says the same thing. In other words, when I'm studying any piece of scripture, I must be able to ask myself, what is the short and? That means what's the 10,000 foot in the air view? That if I just ascend in a, in a chopper into the heavens and I look, what will I see? If I stay on the ground, what will I see? Yeah. So, in other words, let's go back then to that first Timothy and chapter two. First Timothy chapter what? Chapter what again? Chapter two. So it says in verse 11, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, not to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. So we ask, so if I was to ask you, I will ask you, <laughs> if I was to ask you, what is First Timothy about because this this First Timothy two is in First Timothy, yes. So if I can answer what is First Timothy about, then I stand a chance of not being errant or aberrant when I get to this text. Yes, good. Well, somebody accused somebody met me one day in one country like that, not Nigeria, and was accusing me of well. You talk as though God can be understood. And I'm like, and I pray tell, why shouldn't he be understandable? Because this not understanding God thing, it kept people like me out of the kingdom. Yeah, to some people. See, we all wear different. To some people, if you just tell them, that's the way it is. That's it. That's the way it is. But some people are wired like, don't tell me that's the way. I, I must see it. As much as you're a believer, 
I'm a believer with a mind. And he gave me one. And without a mind, anyway, you couldn't become a Christian. Someone says, no, no, no. One day, somebody just said the gospel and it dropped into my spirit. I said, you're a liar. <laughs> it couldn't have dropped into your spirit. If it could drop into your spirit, all that needs to happen is we just get this spirit, spirit phone meter and we just post it towards Oxford Circus so you can work out where the conversation happened. Just, uh, you know Oxford Circus now? December 26. You just post there. You just, you just have the gospel is bearing forth. And people just get to me and say, eh, I became a Christian. <laughs> what? <laughs> What? Why? Well, it, it dropped into the spirit. No, people have a mind. And because they have a mind, they can resist it. Okay? So belief is really persuasion. Belief is persuasion. Whatever your mind is unsure of, your belief can be strong in that area. Yeah? Now, so I'm going to bail you out. Look at, somebody say three comes after two. Let's say together, three comes after two. So I'm going to answer, we ask the question, what is first Timothy about? Yeah, so look at first Timothy 3. Are you there? And let's go to verse 14. First Timothy 3 14. When you are there, everybody, let's read it together. Let's go. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto you. Shut it. Stop, stop, stop. Who wrote Paul? To whom did he write? Timothy. Why did he write? He was away from Timothy. He was hoping to come to Timothy, and he, but he didn't want Timothy to be clueless. Yes. Yes? We didn't make that up, did we? Yes, it's in the text. These things I've written unto you. So Paul is clear about why he wrote. I might not be clear about why Paul wrote. Doesn't mean Paul is not clear. So verse 14 again. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto you, what? Shortly. Verse 15. But if I tarry long, that means, although I'm hoping to come to you, if it takes me a long time, what will I I'm going to do? If I tarry long, that what? Thou may know how thou ought to behave yourself where? In the house of God. Stop, stop, stop. Why has Paul written First Timothy to Paul, to Timothy? Why did Paul write First Timothy to Timothy? So that Timothy will what? Know how to behave. Where? In the house of God. Okay, good. So that means... This is written to teach Timothy about the code of conduct in the house of God. Yes? Good. Let's see what's the house of God. First Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. In the house of God, which is the church. The word church is the word the ekklesia, ek and kaleo in the Greek. It means a gathering by calling out unto. So a gathering, so it's like everybody is in there. What university did you go to again, Aiske? Say it boldly, won't it? Okay, so user interface. So she went to, so it's like now she, she went to user interface. And of course, the person that sat behind her, that, that girl there with looking back, she also went to user interface. Now, so when God wants to get to people in user interface, it will use people that went to that school. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's even laughing, that's cool. Uh, yes, Elizabeth, look up. That's cool. Now, so when you're in that school, see, I hold the mic, not you. So in that school, if you want to call them onto good education, they it's like you and they, you are. You see them, we wanted to glorify her by bringing her into glory, but she remained in suffering. She didn't enter into glory. Now, so you stand at the gate of you are, and you talk to all the people in, you know, I like you, right? You talk to all, all all the people in UI, you call them out and you take them onto the promised land, learning and culture. As in, anyway, so that is ek tale o, right? So to call out of into. So it says, it says, is the, the it says the house of God is the church of the living God. Let me tell you what that means. So this building could be Brother Fashi's house. Yes, this could be Brother Fashi's house. In Brother Fashi's house, you make puff puff glory, puff puff. You may pop puff, puff. You watch Arsenal. Arsenal on one hand, pop up on the other hand as heaven in Brother Fashi's house. Okay, then all of a sudden, Francis and Ogo and Tunde and some people now says, "Brother Fash, 
We've come to your house. Brother Fash has pop up in his mouth. Sister Fash has whatever she has in her mouth. And then uh, uh, Ogo then says, Ah, we have come to fellowship. Then pop up drops. TV is shot. Arsenal dies. Yes, Bible comes out. Bro, Fash is cleaning his hands. And before long, Imbrandin, Stongrab, they begin to talk in tongues. And after a while, they're singing. Now, what has happened? He has been called out of Puff Puff. Yes, he's been called out of the Arsenal match. And yet they are physically in the house of Bro Fash, But he became the house of God by the activities that took place there. Do you understand? Right. Now, so it's a physical building. But now spiritual activities replace the physical activities. So what, that is the ecclesia. So ekaleo, it is, there are things going on. But So I'm talking. So I say, go, look at Jesus, Jesus, dribble him, dribble him, Jesus. And then another person now says, then after three minutes, Ogo comes around and says, Jesus showed up. You better know that they're talking about two different Jesus. Yes. My law showed up. There's a Jesus that was caught against the opposition, not working in love. That Jesus. Now, that one belongs to the house of Brofash. That is, and it's not sinful. At home, people do what home happens. Then that same vicinity, with the same chairs, with the same people, becomes the house of God by calling out. When you are gathered together, everyone has a psalm, a hymn. Before that, everyone was Liverpool, Chelsea, Yimba. Now, but all of a sudden, once there was this calling out, they are called out of their natural thoughts, of their natural dispositions, of their distinctions that divide them, and they are called into a unity of faith. That is what he's talking about. There. So I have written unto you that you may know how to behave yourself the moment we say the saints are gathered in fellowship. Okay, so <laughs> this is important. What I just said is important. So, when I read 1 Timothy 2 and I see marriage there, I have committed a foul because he told us why he wrote what he wrote. It is so that, what is Timothy? A minister. A minister might know how to behave himself when the saints gather. That's why Paul wrote Amen. The thing is, many people read 1 Timothy 2 and they see in it a marriage code. A marriage code, why? Is a man, is a woman. What else will it be if not marriage? And that's not the way you that's not the way you study any book now. When you study, you look at the how can we what is this? It's like this. I'm picking up my uh my physics textbook and I'm talking about capillaries and arteries. The musculoskeletal system. Yeah? I'm about amoeba. Yeah? Amoeba? No. Yeah. You'll be like, sorry, what class are we in? Yeah? That we've been called out of amoeba into differential calculus, differential equations, mathematics, base arithmetic, whatever it is you want to call it. Amen. Praise God. Some people just went to hell now. Just like differential calculus, what now? But my point is this, right? Paul told us here is a point you must let the text talk to you. Let me say it again we are excavators, we are not planters. Now, where brother Sami and Brofash come from, right? If there's peace in an area, you don't want the policeman to show up. Because the policeman will plant the evidence that will create chaos. Where I was born, on the other hand. So in UI, yeah, in UI, that's they always threaten. We'll carry our VC, we'll carry our VC. The VC carries them. But in this school, that school, yeah, the ground and pillar of learning. <laughs> I'm explaining this illustration of learning. <laughs> We carry our VC. <laughs> yeah, we carry, we carry our VC. Although there are those that went to version two of our school, they are measuring the length of their trousers for them. 
it couldn't happen in the days of glory. Now, but you get the point. My point is this. When you read the text of scripture, you must be able to ask yourself, although I don't know what this is, how can I begin to know? Where am I? Am I in a biology class? Or in a physics class? What is he discussing? So Paul, without leaving us in a doubt, told Timothy, I have written to you because I'm not with you. I'm away. I'm coming. I'm on my way. I'm not sure I will come to you as quickly as I think I will. But I want you to know what order in the church looks like. I want you to know what divine order of needs to be like when people are in the house of God. So this man and the woman of First Timothy 2 verse 11 and 12 are in the house of God, not their matrimonial home. Yes? That should not be difficult. Yes? Amen? Amen? Amen. Hey, I don't like what you said. Look at 1 Corinthians 11. Now, what am I about to do? I'm about to show you something that, so Paul that wrote 1 Timothy, he has a tendency. I, I want you to see it in 1 Corinthians 11. He showed it very well in 1 Corinthians 11. Come quickly. 1 Corinthians 11. Uh, and I'm going to go to verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 17. I go. It says, now, verse 17, in this that I declare unto you, I pray to you not, that you come together. Not for the what? Better. But for the worse. Look at verse 18. For first of all, when you come together in the... So what is the church about? Coming together. Yes? So you come together. So when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you. So they were coming together in a way that Paul couldn't praise them. Yes? Now... I'm going to skip because time is going. Uh, look at verse 20. When you come together, therefore, into one place. What did he call that one place earlier? The church. So when you come together into one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, every one of you take care before the other behavior. His own supper. One is hungry. And what? Another is drunken. What? Have you not houses to eat and to drink in? That means you are eating is not the problem, but the way you are eating will not be the eating associated with the saints coming together. Did you follow? So he said to them, you have houses to eat and to drink in. So let's go back to the Brofashionology. So ah, in Brofash's house, there's a way things are done and it's okay there. But in the church of God is the ground. It's the pillar of truth. It's the bulk of truth. Now, so it says here in verse, uh, where am I? First Corinthians 11, 22. What? What? Have you not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God? In other words, if I do not do things in their proper setting, I will soon be shaming people. Look at it again. Despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? Praise you not. Is eating troublesome? No. But there's a way that the eating is associated with their homes. And yet they could still be in somebody's house. But because it's now called the house of God, the church of God, the ecclesia, then when they gather together, they must gather under the rules of the house. Yes? Good. So let's go back again to First Timothy and chapter 2. So uh, it is showing the point that um, le let's now go back to First Timothy 2. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 11. Let the woman learn. Let the woman what? Learn. So I, I, if I were you, I would circle the word learn. That's the verb there. Let the woman learn. That's the action. Let the woman learn in silence. With all subjection. I don't know. We, we need help to misunderstand that. Paul just said, make sure that what? The woman learns. Who is it that learns? Everyone. What do you call a learn somebody that learns? A student. Where is this learning taking place? So what is this person? A disciple. Yeah. So you know what? Let you know what? Do not debar a woman from being a disciple. That means on the basis of whatever you guys have been doing, actually, don't debar, don't stop, don't hinder, don't constrain. A woman 
on a, it says here in verse 11, let the woman learn. Let it happen. Now, so let the woman learn, meaning the door to studentship, the door to education, the door to education in what? Sound doctrine, because it's the ground and the pillar of truth. So what is being learned? Truth. So when I say let the woman learn, it's not to let the woman learn how to wash her husband's clothes. That's what he's talking about here. About here. It's let the woman learn the truth. And I'm not even saying it's wrong for anybody to wash anybody's clothes. That's not my point. You won't drag me into that kind of matter. Now, so it, it says here, let the, why? That belongs in Brother Fashe's house. Yeah. And if they like, they can say that they are cut. It's what washes on the clothes. Fine. It floats their boat. Hooray. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Good. So in verse, in verse uh, 12, next verse. But, we're still going to go into it further. But I suffer not a woman to what? Stop, stop, stop. What, when you say I suffer not, uh, does anybody have a contemporary version? Uh, NIV, something that's not King James. That's okay. You are still talking in this service. Okay, read it, read it. So what does the word suffer not mean? Permission. So I don't permit. Now, so Paul is saying, I don't permit a woman to teach. My friends, please, if we're not going to be biased, that verse does not stand on its own. What your question should be, what woman? Hmm? Yes. What did you just read before you read that sentence? What did you just read? Let the woman learn. So what woman is not permitted to teach? The one that should be learning. And it makes sense. So if you are to be learning and you are trying to teach, we don't permit it. It's not difficult. Hey, you're making it that simple. No, 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 no. Women are not their mates. Well, look. Yeah. Amen. 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 So he's talking about a woman. You know, when we was starting, I said, sometimes you have to throw away the verses because the verses, they hinder us. Because your, our mind is in, we've now finished verse 11. So in your mind, you compartmentalize it and say, au revoir, finish, so fini, finito. Yeah, it's done. But then you enter into trouble, but, 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 right? I suffer not a woman to teach. What woman? The woman he just talked about. So let's read it better. So will it help? Let's say you wanted to say it in 21st century colloquialism or the way we talk. You can say it like, I don't suffer her to teach. She should learn. Yes? Yes? Okay. So I suffer not a woman to, to uh, I, 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 I let her learn in silence with all what? With all what? Subjection. What does it mean to learn in silence? Because we're going to come back to it. So she should learn what? You know, yeah. Now, so let's say we don't even know what those words mean yet, right? As at verse 12, if the woman is teaching, what do you call that? Teaching where? In the church. He's not saying, ah, uh, woman. I'm driving the car and I'm trying to explain to me how to drive. Did the Bible not say, I suffer not a woman to teach? Learn in silence. Your husband is driving. Yeah. My husband, my husband. No. Your wife is, I shouldn't start a song that way. No. But that's not what he said. That's not what he said. That's not what he said. Life itself teaches you that they are, amen. Verse 12. I suffer not the woman to teach where? In the church. Yeah. So that means when I'm reading this, I must then remember all the scriptures about church and teaching. Mm, because he hasn't stopped what he's talking about. That you may know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God. Yes? 
Okay, let me ask you one more time. Who is the enforcer of what is in verse 12? Let's see if you're following. Who is to enforce 1 Timothy 2, 12? I suffer not a woman to teach. Who's to enforce it? Huh? Timothy! Timothy! I hope you understand that myself, Seku, I don't have a right, even as your pastor, to come to your home to dictate how your home should be. Ha! Yes. As you don't have into mind. Yes. Yes. But you can invite me as I can you. You know, you know when you have friends that say you can't say anything, you know that they really don't mean that you say anything. You know, they said it within the confine of what is permissible. Let me say it again. Uh, put it differently. Let's say that a wife wants a husband to wear a white shirt. Do you suppose Jesus would say buy blue? No. The, the, the colors are not on fire. That's not the thing that is affecting the Lord of glory. He doesn't have a girlfriend. How will he know how? Yeah. Amen. Someone said, are you talking about the Lord of glory? He has no problems with what I just said. Amen. Timothy is the enforcer of this. If you don't understand this thing, you would think this means that a pastor has a jurisdiction in the home of the saints. No, I don't. Nor do you. As your disciple, I command you, get up from your bed now. You are not going to the office tomorrow. The way you've been doing your spiritual life, I need to see you begin to step up. You are meeting me at Heights Park. We're going, to, we're going to be just praying. We're going to be just walking on the road and praying for the next 48 hours. If you die, you die. And if you live, you live. And why do you say, why are you doing it? I have authority over you. <laughs> and just like my friend, go and sit down. Yes. Some people need a cut to control. Yeah. Sincerely. Mm -hmm. If you have a control bug, get a cat. <laughs> Amen? Life is easy. Yes? Yes? Yes. Now, but first Timothy 2, so it's a woman teaching. So when I'm, so therefore I must ask myself, in this old first Timothy 2, what did Paul tell Timothy about teachers and the way they ought to behave themselves in the house of God, the church, the ground, and the pillar of truth? That's what, that's what I must. Because if I don't do that, I will reach conclusions in isolation. Yes? Yes? Okay. So we see what the setting is. That if he's talking about a woman to teach, he's talking about ministry. I first want to settle that in your heart. He's talking about ministry. And in fact, the ministry of the word of God. In the ground and the pillar of truth. Yes. And that the danger, the great danger that they were going to face. Okay, stop. Paul told Timothy, 1 Timothy 3, chapter, verse 15, that you may know how you ought to behave. Wait, wait, wait. Who does Paul want to be of good behavior? Timothy. Ah, oh, really well, though. Who does Paul want to be of good behavior? Timothy. So when I'm reading this, I must be asking myself, when did Paul stop talking to Timothy? Or did he? Yes? Is it? Uh, is that a uh, your people followed me here. <laughs> I just said Jesus. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. So the setting of First Timothy 2 is the ground and the pillar. Anytime you are having a conversation in your heart, in your mind as a student of the word of God, do not be afraid of where the truth may lead you. And don't be in a hurry. to. You know when people are talking, just gloss over things. Yeah, let's forget that side. Don't forget it. Stay there. Stay there. It affects us. Because many things are hinged on it. Yeah? Many things. Because all of a sudden, if I'm not careful, and I make that marriage, all of a sudden, the regulator of the marriage is then the pastor. But the moment I understand that is the church, then it makes sense why Paul is talking to Timothy about how he ought to behave himself in the church, the house of God. Yes? 
Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, so because for long, somebody can tell you, uh, well, your, your wife must leave their house now and go and work in uh, Yugoslavia. Why? As your pastor, I said so. And he will show you this text, and you will say, like, ah, see, you see that one's about marriage, right? Yes. And that one says, how oh, you may behave yourself. Forget about the house of God. Your house is the house of God. Everything is just the house of God. Don't worry about it. Now, I'm telling you now, you have to just do what I've said. And trouble starts. And somebody says, is the Bible, is this Bible? If you believe the Bible too much, you get into trouble. No, no, no. It's because people don't read the Bible and read it with a heart that is unbiased. It's you say whatever it says. We are believers. He gave us a mind because he wants us to think through the stents. Yeah? Now, so now that, that is, uh, uh, again, it's not discussing the home. I want you to see that. It's not discussing the home. Now, look at where did he start? This is 1 Timothy 2. We're in verse 11 and 12, right? So let's go back. Let's go back up to assure ourselves. Let's say I'm not sure it's ministry. So I go all the way to verse 7. Whereunto, verse 7, I'm in 1 Timothy 2 now. Whereunto, I am what? Ordained. Uh, you have to make a mistake not to know as ministry. I am what? Ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ. I lie not a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. I will therefore. So if he just said I'm ordained a minister, I will therefore that men lift up holy hands, the men lifting up holy hands is ministry. Yes? Okay. So what it means is when you're singing songs, just say everybody lift up all your hands. We lift the hand in the song to hurry. Bing, 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 bing. Now, nothing wrong if you're doing that, but don't tell me it's based on this test of scripture. Amen. 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 Yeah. So we're going to find out what it means. We just explain what it means to lift up all your hands. Now, the guy said, I am appointed a teacher. An apostle, therefore, let men. Now, so that's seven. Go back to verse one. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, I what? I exhort, therefore, that first of all. So before Paul got to that verse 11 of I saw not a woman, he said, first of all, I exhort. What did he exhort, first of all? supplications and what again prayers and then what again intercessions and what again giving of things we made for all men for king stop 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 what is what do kings do they rule the reign oh the and in first timothy 2 let's go to first timothy 5 first timothy 5 17 first timothy 5 17 first timothy 5 17 can i go on let, let's read it together. Want to go? Let the elder stop. What's an elder? A minister. Let the elders that rule well. So who are those that rule? Elders. What had Paul called them earlier? Kings. Yes. Amen. So when he said kings and those in authority, where are they in authority? In the church, the ground, the pillar of truth is important. It's important. Otherwise, you'll be convinced he's talking about parliament and you'll be sure he's talking about uh, all those stuff. Now, boy he said here yeah, for giving things. And this makes sense because Paul will always tell you, who does Paul always tell us to pray for? Huh? Those not, ministers... First Thessalonians. <laughs> I like the spirit of murmuring. Now, first Timothy 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Are you there? And verse 17. Let's read together. Pray without season. Let's go to verse 25. Brethren, pray for us. Okay? So, Paul is asking the brethren to pray for them. Come to Hebrews and chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13, and I am in verse 18. Let me read verse 17. Obey them that have the rule. Can you see the rule? Verse 17, obey them that have the what? Rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch over your. So this rule is over the soul. As they that will give an account that they may do it what? 
with joy, not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. So if they rule badly, it affects you. Yes? Read the next line, verse 18. Pray for us. So when it talks about those in authority, it follows it up with prayer. Pray for us. Pray for us. Yes? Second Thessalonians and chapter 3. Are you there? Second Thessalonians and chapter 3. Verse 1. Finally, brethren, what? Pray for us. Okay, I could multiply scriptures. So Paul's emphasis when it comes to the saints praying will be located or localized in the church. And he will say to start it with those in authority or the rulers. So when he says, first of all, let's go back to First Timothy. Now, see what we just did there. We are going through what Paul wrote and then what some other people wrote. I'm one of those that don't believe that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Now, uh, is it going to affect your spiritual growth? No. If you believe that Paul wrote it, kudos to you. If I tell you why I believe wrote it, there will be trouble in this place. But like, now, I believe what I believe, but the interpretation of a text of scripture doesn't hinge on who wrote it. Amen. Amen? Amen. Good. <laughs> Where was I? First Timothy 2, verse 1. Okay, see all the dancing we are doing in order to make sense of verse 11 and 12. Yes? Good. So, verse 1 Timothy 2, 1. I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, he taught this elsewhere, that pray for me also, the utterance beginning me. So, supplications, prayers, and sessions, and giving of times be made for all men. What it means by all men is for kings and those that are in authority. Why? That you may lead a quiet and peaceable life. That means that they are going to watch over your soul and they're going to give an account over your soul that things may be well with you. Amen? Good. So, won't you ask yourself, because that's First Timothy 2, 1. He said, I exhort therefore. So, if I see therefore, I must ask myself, what is therefore therefore? So, there must be something he has said. What I'm trying to show you is that Paul is in the middle of conversation about ministry. And he said, first of all, the first thing I'm trying to sort out is you got to pray for the rulers who are in authority. Why? In their footsteps, we find ours. In their persuasions, we find ours. In their doctrine, we are affected. So it makes sense. Now, uh, Daniel, good to see you. Now, so if you go back one chapter, one verse, let's go back one verse. One verse, one verse. One, where are we? What chapter? Chapter what? Chapter one. Let's read verse 20. Of whom is, let's read together verse 20. Let's go. Of whom is Hermonius and Alexander, whom I, who is I, Paul, have delivered unto opposition that they may. Uh, so there are those that should learn. I have delivered some people over that they may what? Learn not to blaspheme. To blaspheme means to speak contrary to truth. So it says, ah, so, so now we see the context of 1 Timothy 2. That it was a conversation about Hermeneus and Alexander. Right, and it says, I, I have actually opposed what they are teaching so that they may learn and stop blaspheming. I exhort, therefore. So, why is he exhorting? Because we will have ministers like Hermeneus and Alexander. Yes, let's go back again. We're going to go back. So, let's go back to verse 19 now. First Timothy 1, verse 19. I'm going backwards, so you just see the I'm trying to, we're doing real time, locating the beginning of a thought. So verse 19, holding faith and what? A good conscience. Oh, stop. You remember Hebrews 13 that we read about the ministers? It says, pray for us, for we trust that we have a good conscience. Who are those that need a good conscience? Those that rule over others. Yes? Okay. In other words, if a minister doesn't have a good conscience, he would take this word and use it to enslave people. Yeah? So I could just tell you, for example, hmm, let's say I'm hungry this morning and I've not eaten. I just come and say, and you say you love your pastor. The Bible says in Galatia chapter 6, verse 6, I shall communicate. Say communicate. Communicate. Co communicate unto him that actually teaches you in material things. Say material. Material. So, yeah, if your minister so spiritual, what do you so about? Material. 
and I go further for what a man's soul he shall reap. What do you want to reap? And the real thing moving me is I'm hungry. <laughs> yes. Right? So that's not good conscience. I will miss Yan. Yeah, I will, I will speak OP. I have to. Because my motivation was not the word. It was whose God is their belly. Ah, the best explainer, explainer of scripture is the belly of man. When the person is hungry, there's nothing you cannot do. I can do all things so Christ strengthens me. You can put more hand into your pocket now and bring it out and come and lay it at this altar. You can. Someone say, I can, I can, I can, I can. If you've not paid your rent, you can still put your hand there. I can do. Oh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The 16 people that dipped their hands in their pockets, the one I was in a meeting in Russia the other day. And when they got home, they received a letter. They became the vice president of Russia, all of them at once. <laughs> <laughs> You, you, don't, you don't even know how to listen to bad doctrine. Look at you. You're laughing. By now, you should be running to the front saying, I want to plug into the anointing. I say, now, but why will I be saying that? I'll be, I'll be seeing what the scripture is saying with my eyes, but I'll be saying what my belly is dictating. Yes? So, amen. Of whom is Alexander and Hermanius. <laughs> right? So, verse 19, he said they are to, a minister is to hold on to what? Faith, First Timothy 1 19, and a good conscience which some haven't put away. So, if I throw my conscience away concerning this Bible, I will say all sorts, amen. So, it says, which some haven't put away concerning uh faith, I've made what a shipwreck. Shipwreck means the ship started the journey, it's ministry, so their ministerial life started in the truth. But he veered, of course, when they joined bad conscience to the doctrine. Yeah? So it says, an example of ministers that have done that, that abandoned the good conscience, Hermeneus and Alexander. What did I do? I opposed them. How did I oppose them? By telling you about them, that those kind of ministers are not a good example. Why did he say it? He hates them? No, that they may... Learn. So, in other words, what were Amenius and Alexander doing before Paul accosted them? They were teaching. What happened after Paul engaged them? They stopped teaching so that they can learn. Then they will stop blaspheming. So, what's the problem? What's the big problem in, uh, in the church that Paul was pastoring? There were many people that were talking. They didn't know what they were talking about. They were opening their mouth, often having beautiful oratory. But what they were saying was actually causing trouble. Paul would then come and engage them and he would stop what they were doing and say, you got to learn. This is the use of the word learn earlier. So when he says, let the woman learn, later, in just a chapter after, we are having the context. Amen. Amen? Okay, now. So, um, uh, uh, in other words, what we have looked at thus far, is this fact that Paul, another way to look at it is this. If you read the book of Timothy, the whole of the book of Timothy, and I, I ask of you uh, today or tomorrow, or they're about to read it, how many girls, as in female gender, yes, how many female gender did Paul mention in the writing to Timothy? That he says, that person is teaching. Stop her. Stop her. Stop her. I'm serious. You're reading in context now. Every time Paul actually mentions a person to stop, it tends to be male, funny enough. Of whom is Alexander. And I mean, if you check the Greek of the names, they are feminine words, not masculine. That's first Timothy. Let's go to second Timothy. My friend. Let's go to 2 Timothy. Chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Study. To show yourself approved unto God a walk man that needed not to be ashamed rightly. Dividing what? The word of truth. 16. But Sean, what do you do? Sean. Profane and then what did he call it? Babbling. Yay, that's insult. Babbling. For they will increase unto ungodliness. And their word. So the, some people's preaching is what Paul called babbling. 
that increases unto on God. What's ungodliness? The more you listen to them talk, the more you will talk like they are talking. And what they are talking is not what God talked. Ungodliness. They don't sound like God. They don't talk like God. They don't approach. They don't study. So ungodliness there is not smoking cigar. Ungodliness there is actually behaving like a spiritual smoker. That is, I look at the word of God. I see what he's saying. But what I'm saying is not what he's saying. Yes? Do you get the point? Yeah? So, can I go on? Verse 17. And their word, that means their message, will eat as doth a cancer of whom is Ammonius and Philetus, who, concerning the truth, have heard our saying. Yes? What did they do? So, you see that in Paul's letter to Timothy, where he's talked about some people ought not to teach. When he finishes talking about them thoroughly, you'll find he's talking about ministers. And strange enough, the ministers tend to be male. Amen. So, hold on. So, let, let me tell you what is important. So, let's say that you, you read First Timothy 2 and you believe that when he said the woman should not teach, he's talking about gender. Let's say for example you believe that. Yeah? Then it would be, what would be the basis of their not teaching? Gender. Then, if the basis of their teaching is not of not teaching is gender, then there should be no problem with a man, because the men already meet the gender qualification. Someone say, "Eh, but if you're not a man, there's not." Uh -uh. Mm -mm. It is you. What you examine is did that person study? Who studies? A learner, a student. Yeah. <laughs> so, what are they supposed to do? Study to show yourself approved. The word approved is from a Greek word that means, what it means, something is there. It is not obvious. If we scratch it, it will show. It's like if you're doing a chemistry experiment. You have, you know that if you, they will tell you to test for a particular thing and say, tell us what that metal is. And you know that there are tests that you apply that if this thing is gold. You know that times when a girl is praying that this thing be gold. It's not really gold. But she wants to turn it through alchemy to gold. So, but there's a, there are chemical experiments that you apply onto metals to, pro, to say that one is gold. It's chemistry. Amen. So if you know that the chain on your neck is not gold, you won't want to apply the test. You don't want it approved as what it really is. So you won't do it. That's what he's talking about there. But you, you study to show yourself because you've been well trained. You are well brought up. That if I study, what has I've been trained in will come out. That means Paul has taught Timothy. If Timothy exercises himself soundly, what will come out of him will be what Paul has taught him. Amen. Okay. So again, you, I'm, we're, we're, we have not even delved into the text itself, but we're just going in the periphery, looking 10,000, we're coming to 8 or 6 or 5. But what we can see is, Paul has written a letter where he has pointed out that there's the real problem is the words that come out of a man. And that if those words hurt like a cancer, then whoever speaks that word must be stopped. It will then go ahead to give names and say, you, Timothy, the way that you will not belong to that category is you are going to study to show yourself approved. A workman that does not need to be ashamed. How? Rightly dividing. Timothy, how will you get there? Let's go back to chapter 2, verse 2. 2 Timothy 2, 2. It says, or 2-1, Thou therefore, my son. My what? Thou therefore, my, my son. Who is the son? Read it. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that you have. Hold on. If you have heard of me, what does that make you to me, Timothy? You are a son. A son is somebody that hears, which means is a student. Now, hold your hand in that uh, first, second Timothy 2 and verse 2. Let, let me finish it. And the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same. The same commit you to faithful men. What is their faithfulness? They will be able to teach others also. That means they will teach as they've been taught. Timothy, why are you a minister? I taught you. What should you teach? What I taught you. 
Who should you let teach? Those that will teach as they've been taught. Now, look, that is 2 Timothy 2. Go all the way down to chapter 3 and look at verse 14. So we are, we are, we are actually circumnavigating on the very top of the text of Paul so that we can say for sure what he is not saying or what he's saying. So 2 Timothy and chapter 3, I'm in verse 14. But he's talking to, he's talking to, um, uh, let me read from verse 13. But evil men and what? Seducers shall wax worse and worse. Deceiving and being. So what is the problem? Deception. What, who are those that deceive? Seducers. Who are seducers? Hold your hand there. Someone say, ah, we know what a seducer is. Yeah? First Timothy 4. First Timothy 4. See, we are running around Timothy there, yeah? First Timothy 4. Yeah, 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 yeah. First Timothy 4. Look at verse 1. Now, the Spirit speaketh expressly in the latter times. Yeah? Some shall depart from the light, giving it to seducing spirits. And so a seducing spirit and which is, that is to say, so a seducing spirit, what is it? A doctrine that is diabolical. A doctrine of devils. A doctrine that attacks the believer. A teaching that opposes the saint. Yeah. How will they do it in verse 2? Look at the doctrine in verse 2. Speaking lies in hypocrisy. Having what? They are conscience. We're back to the conscience thing again. Yeah. Having what again? Their conscience. Yes, so it's talking about ministry. Having what again? Their conscience. Their conscience what? Steered with a hot iron. What will happen? They will start teaching funny things. They will forbid you to marry. They will command you not to eat meat, which God received to be, uh, command, created to be received with thanksgiving of them that believe and know the truth. Where would they know the truth? In the church, the ground, and the pillar of truth. Yes? Where would they know the truth? In the ground and the pillar of truth. Why would they not know the truth? There will be some that will be teaching. And what they are teaching will seduce the believers. Yes? Huh? What they are teaching will seduce the believers. And when they seduce the believers, they'll believe a lie. Now, who are the seducers? The preachers. What do they preach? Not the truth, the lie. Look at verse, uh, I'm deliberately just traversing Timothy. There's a first Timothy, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, second Timothy, chapter 2. Chap now, to just say, look at Paul, what he wrote. If I take the totality of his writings, I can then come to bear in first Timothy 2 without fail. Because we're not rushing into this one. So, in, uh, where am I again? It's 1 Timothy 4. We speak at, uh, uh, sorry, I'm in verse 3. Forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from mates, which God created to be received with what? Thanksgiving of them that believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be what? Receiving thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by what? The word of God. So if somebody is not preaching the word of God, I will not be able to receive what God has given. Is that clear? Good. I will not be able to receive what God has given. So verse 6. If you put the brethren in remembrance, who is to do this? Timothy. If you put the bread in remembrance of these things, you will be a good minister. So how many kind of ministers are in Paul's letter to Timothy? It's not male and female. It is good ministers, bad ministers. Yes? Yeah? It's not male and female. It is good and bad. Amen. Praise God. You'll be a good, that means even Timothy was under danger of not being a good minister. So while, how is Paul combating it? I've written these things to you. That you, Timothy, you may know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God, the church of a living God. Amen. Amen. Now, so hold on. This someone is not what you listen to with bias in your mind. And this someone if you are given to bias, wow, it's going to persecute your mind. Let's go. I'll, I'll stop in two. Thanks, Olati. Thank you. What shall I render? First Timothy chapter 4. It says in verse uh, 7, but refuse. Verse 7, what did it say you should do? Refuse. Can you see? The instruction is hand over to Satan. That means refuse it. So that's Satan. When he says, I've delivered to Satan, he explains himself. It just means refuse, oppose it. Doesn't mean you say, Lucy, 
Lucy, Lucy, Lucifer. Bro, Lucifer, you know, sometimes we, you and us, we tax him because there are some Christians who must show pepper. So Lucifer, right now, because you are the sixth, sixth gift in the resurrection, the, wherever, wherever the pastor, evangelist, pastor, prophet uh, fails, <laughs> thou takest over, O Lucy. You know, it's like, like in 1 Corinthians 5. To the, such a one to Satan. And someone say, hey, you see, whenever there's a problem in the church, and the church doesn't know what to do, he doesn't, Lucy, Lucy, <laughs> that sister there, deal with her. Take her life or his life. <clears throat> see, that is not understanding the Bible, though. What God redeemed, he hasn't given you the right to hand over. It's not even yours to hand over. Anyway, uh, are you there? But refuse profane and old wives. Okay, now, when it says old wives, that tells you that this is a problem that girls have, right? Yeah. Who has a problem called old wives' fables? Amanios, Alexander, Philetus, and if Timothy is not careful, Timor. Are you clear? Are you there? Yes? So when you say old wife, does it mean you better be careful? You see, as our sisters get older, there's that, I mean, that 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 is somebody smoking Indian something. I mean, old, says, so ah, I can show you. The Bible didn't say old men's fables. It said old wife. There's a reason. My friend, you are gender biased. And we're born that way. We're born into it. We're born into it. It's spooky. Verse 7, but refuse profane and old wives fables and exercise yourself rather to what? So what, what is the exercise? What is the gymnasium? That's the word. What's the gymnasium of godliness? How do you develop seven pack as a minister? You exercise yourself in doctrine. You exercise. The, the thing will be smelling beside you like this. Like, ah, say what is concurrent. 79 steps onto a greater life. 42 steps onto a fat bank account. 63 ideas that will change your world. 42, 42 things that, ever, that changed Babylon. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. And soon the church will be like Babylon. Verse 7. But refuse profane and old wives fables and exercise yourself rather to what? Godliness. For what? Bodily exercise. What's bodily exercise? Telling people not to eat, not to marry. That's bodily exercise. Bodily exercise there is not going to do push up. Bodily exercise there is yeah, amen. Yeah, for bodily exercise, that means don't eat, don't touch, don't undo. It says it, it has a little profit. It's all enough. Some people say this is the scripture for going to the gym. It's not. You should go to the gym because you should go to the gym. Well, how do you know you should go to the gym? Ah, the Bible says in First Timothy 4 8 that God, bodily exercise, brother, little, so I'm going to take a little. Don't, this little should not be taken. This one here. Yeah, you should exercise yourself rather. Unto godliness for bodily exercise, don't touch, don't handle, don't taste. It's probably little, right? But look what it says it says, But godliness that means being sound, staying with the truth is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life and now is and in that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. So, what Paul told Timothy is, What I'm really saying, you better listen well. You are in danger of it. And Timothy, if you start saying what you should not say, go and learn. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Don't pick your statements from Emmanuel and Pilatus or from Emmanuel and Alexander. Right? I suffer not a woman. What woman? That person who should learn what is teaching. Amen. Amen. Look, in case you don't get it, you read first Timothy 2 later. Adam is a bad student. Eve is a bad student. None of them is a good student. If you read First Timothy 2, what is Adam? Romans 9 says, Romans 5 says uh, that Adam was in disobedience. Disobedience simply means I will not heed, I will not listen. So, what kind of student is Adam? One plus one, two. I don't, I don't like that. That's Adam. Bad student. If somebody skipped one plus one class and they want to teach you differential calculus, my friend, you're in hell. What is Eve? It says, as the serpent beguiled Eve, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So what is Eve? The tendency to add to the truth. What is Adam? I will not listen to it at all. I will listen to another. 
Who told you? That's Adam. So in 1 Timothy 2, when Paul brings up Adam and Eve, he's showing you students you must not copy. Amen. Praise God. Rise to your feet, everybody. Rise to your feet, everybody. Praise God. 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 